Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We're just getting started with Tuesday's webinar. We've just opened the room and we have folks joining us. Those that are joining us, thank you so much for hanging out with us on Tuesday for our Coaching HQ webinar with Maya and Tara. We're going to get started in a few moments. It's great to see folks filing in. Hoping you had a wonderful day yesterday at day one of the NOW conference, kicking off day two. Got Wednesday coming up. We've got the in-person full day, the main day of the NOW conference on Thursday coming up at the Oakland Marriott City Center. We're so excited to see so many of you there. And then we've got our Friday wrap-up stuff going on. It's this day chock full of exciting activities sort of week. And we're so excited to see you all join us. We're going to give it a few moments before we get started. Thanks y'all so much for jumping on the call. <clears throat> Great to see everybody. We have the number of attendees climbing, climbing. It's 9.01. We're going to give it some Berkeley time. For folks who are joining us from around the UC, not etched in stone practice, but there's a little buffer at Berkeley for when we start our meetings. <laughs> and we are exercising that practice as we speak. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We'll get started in just a few moments. Also, great to see a lot of folks who joined us yesterday back for round two. So great to be with y'all. We hope you have a little tea or coffee, water, a little snack for your morning hour here. Hope you're comfy in your chair. Maybe you've got some breathing practices going on for your morning grounding. With all that, we are so excited to get started and we are gonna do just that. So good morning, everybody. My name is Colin, he, him pronouns. Uh, some of y'all met me yesterday at Monday's webinar with Leisha. So glad to see y'all come back. I am the Senior Talent Strategy Partner at UC Berkeley People and Culture and People and Organization Development. I'm your moderator for today's session and for our Coaching HQ webinars through the week. This year, I have the great honor of serving as the Coaching HQ lead for the 2023 NOW Conference. And, you know, we are just about to get started with day two of Now Week. Tremendously excited for that. And for those attending the pre and post Now Conference Coaching act HQ activities through the week, uh, we hope that you had a great time working with your group and one-on-one -on -one coaches yesterday and are excited about all of the group and one-on-one -on -one coaching that'll happen today one-on-one -on -one, uh, career and talent acquisition appointments that will happen tomorrow, our group coaching that will go on through the week. It's a full day of programming, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. And also for those who are attending the main day of the in-person NOW conference on Thursday, we're so excited to see you at the Oakland Marriott on June 8th. Check your email uh, for a note from now conference at berkeley.edu for more information about getting excited and getting ready for Thursday's activities in person at the Oakland Marriott. So we look forward to seeing all of you there who will be joining us. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize our main conference sponsor, UC Berkeley People and Culture. A huge thanks to Dr. Angela Stoffer, our Chief Learning Officer and Director of People and Organization Development for her executive sponsorship of this UC-wide event. It's amazing to see attendees from all across the UC system participating in the week of activities. So another big shout out to Lisa Reichert and Ying Kwa for their excellent NOW Conference co-chair leadership and the entire NOW Conference planning team for their efforts in bringing this conference to life. We are going to get started in just a few moments. You are totally welcome to toggle on or off captions during this event. I also wanted to let you know that this session is recorded. The slide deck can be found on the NOW Conference Coaching HQ webpage. Today, our chat is actually going to be 
disabled and our Q&A will be enabled. We'll also have a checkpoint at the middle of today's presentation to take some Q&A and we'll have a little bit of time for that at the end of our webinar. As a quick reminder, our webinar presentation today is not necessarily the interactive element of this topic. Of course, you know that the more interactive, hands-on, debrief, dialogue, skills, practice, experience will follow this hour. So for those who have registered for their one-on or their group coaching for today's topic, we'll leave a little bit of room at the end of today's webinar so that you can mosey on over to those Zoom links that were sent to you by now coaching HQ at berkeley.edu. We are so excited to have with us here today. Uh, big drum roll, please, the UC Berkeley Talent Acquisition Team, who will be serving as today's group coaches after today's nine o'clock webinar, starting at 10 o'clock. Many, many, many thanks to Alejandro Gomez and his amazing team for their innovation collaboration and facilitation at the NOW conference this year, and also for facilitating those one-on-one -on -one talent acquisition sessions on Wednesday. You know, today is all about our journeys as lifelong interviewees, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our webinar and introducing you to Maya Compton and Tara Hertzstein from the UC Berkeley talent acquisition team, who will be presenting on the topic, you got the interview, now what? So with that, um, I want to share a little bit more about our amazing presenters, Maya and Tara, before we get started. And then I am totally going to get out of their way and the floor will be theirs for our hour. So as a talent acquisition advisor, Maya Compton provides advisement and recruitment uh, guidance to various clients at UC Berkeley. These include UC Berkeley Law, the School of Public Health, Facility Services, Berkeley People and Culture, Equity Inclusion, Housing and Dining Services, the Disabled Students Program, Accounting, Procurement, College of National Resources, uh, the Department of Chemistry, and many, many others. Gosh, Maya, you are all over the place uh, at Cal. In addition, Maya has facilitated workshops and trainings regarding the recruitment process and professional development as it relates to the university experience. Leading with authenticity, she is passionate about providing excellent customer service and encouraging people to meet and achieve their full potential. Love it and so happy to have you here, Maya. Tara Hertzstein is also a talent acquisition advisor within People and Culture. She has over 10 years of experience at the university and is passionate about attracting and hiring talented professionals who are committed to helping shape and further promote the mission of the university. Her portfolio includes providing support for over 70 departments on campus, oh my gosh, including student affairs, intercollegiate athletics, vice chancellor of research, university development and alumni relations office, just to name a few. Aside from talent acquisition, Tara dedicates time and energy to facilitating, organizing, and participating in various employee engagement opportunities that encourage staff to develop their professional skills further. So also just like a huge thanks just to be in your presence, Maya and Tara. Your amazing work is truly immeasurable in this space. Not only are you presenting today, you also were instrumental in designing and bringing to life our group coaching experience uh, this morning as well. So we applaud you for that and we thank you so much for your incredible work. Uh, so with all that, a big UC warm welcome everybody to Maya and Tara. So thanks so much and the floor is y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colin, for such a warm welcome. Um, we are very appreciative to join everyone today. And thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. You got the interview now. What? I hope everyone has been reconnecting, recharging, and reimagining their next opportunity at work. Today, we're going to get into some hot topics about what happens after you get that long-awaited interview call, the one you've been waiting for. There are so many different components of the interview process, and even as internal candidates, you still have to prepare. Interviewing is super necessary, so it's important to be prepared, whether the interview is virtual or in person, or if it's going to be with your hiring manager or current colleagues. 
You wanna be ready for those basic or complex common interview questions and ready to close the interview after you've done all that good work telling folks why you deserve the job. We're here to guide you through the interview process and provide you with some helpful tips and tricks that can help you land the role. Starting with helping you understand why you even have to interview. So you may be thinking to yourself, I'm internal. Why do I even have to interview? Why do I have to go through the process? Super short story. Years ago, I was working for another company um, and I saw an open role on our career page that I thought I would be perfect for. I mean, I was already doing the work. I was already a part of the team. My manager and I were super cool. And I felt like this would be an easy opportunity for a quick promotion, a little extra coin and an increase. I asked my supervisor about the position and let them know of my interest. And he said, I had to apply. Immediately, a bunch of thoughts ran through my head. The first one was the audacity. Wasn't I the best? Didn't my supervisor always come to me with things he needed me to do? Why do I have to interview if I'm internal? Why do I have to interview if I'm already doing this work on an interim basis? And if I have to apply, I better be considered. So yes, my ego kicked all the way in. And I had to dial it back. I had to remember that there were probably other people just like me interested in this opportunity. And if I wanted the position, I had to prove it and I had to work for it just like everybody else. That would only be fair. So what is a fair and equitable recruitment process? And why did my manager tell me that I had to apply for the position? From a macro perspective, a fair and equitable recruitment process is important for several reasons. Number one, fair and equitable should always be hashtag goals. That is the name of the game. Number two, a fair and equitable recruitment process can really help attract a diverse talent pool and increase the likelihood of finding the most qualified and talented candidate for the position, which could definitely be you. And number three, we believe in and promote a culture of inclusivity and diversity, which leads to better problem solving, better decision making, and by providing this culture, we can help to avoid legal issues and discrimination claims that can arise from discriminatory hiring practices. At UC Berkeley, we really seek to establish clear job requirements and qualifications. We use objective and standardized selection criteria, avoid bias in job advertisements, and provide reasonable accommodations for applicants with disabilities. We train our hiring managers and selection committees on the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion best practices to make sure everyone is equipped to identify and mitigate any unconscious biases that may have an effect on the hiring process. So what are the benefits of an open recruitment? By opening a recruitment up to any and everyone who wishes to apply, both internally and externally, we see increased diversity, more qualified candidates, reduced bias and discrimination, and improved employee morale. And because we've been transparent and open this opportunity to all, we don't limit the applicant pool. So speaking of fairness, one of the biggest challenges we see in recruitment is addressing biases that can influence hiring decisions. And biases are often unconscious, and can shape the way hiring managers evaluate candidates. It is crucial for us to strive for fair and objective evaluations to ensure a diverse and inclusive workforce. Some of the most common biases we come across is the age old and tired, and unfortunately still relevant concept of stereotyping based on gender, race, and ethnicity. It's 2023, and these assumptions have no place in the hiring process. Closed-mindedness and navigating recruitments with these biases at the forefront, instead of focusing on the qualifications of the applicant, hampers diversity and inclusivity. Same with stereotyping, both attraction and confirmation bias can also lead to unfair hiring practices. Attraction bias is simply favoring candidates who are similar to yourself. And we see this when hiring managers select candidates who may share a similar background or similar characteristics. While confirmation bias is when a hiring manager seeks information that confirms pre-existing beliefs they may have had about a candidate. 
rather than objectively evaluating the candidate based on their qualifications. During interviews, biases can manifest through subtle cues or personal preferences, influencing the evaluation process. When biases persist in the recruitment process, they further perpetuate inequality and hinder the recruitment of underrepresented groups. Overcoming biases is essential to building a diverse and inclusive workforce that reflects the society we live in today. From an HR perspective, we have policies in place to ensure bias is eliminated in the recruitment process. And with that said, even after we do our due diligence with requiring implicit bias and search committee trainings, we don't live in a perfect world and bias can happen. Recognizing bias during an interview can be challenging and it's important to recognize bias and know what you can do as an applicant. And for instance, if the interviewer makes assumptions about, your, about you based on your gender, race, age, or other characteristics, it may indicate bias. If the interviewer asks questions that are not related to the job requirements or are seemingly inappropriate, this can also indicate bias. If the interviewer frequently interrupts you or talks over you, it may indicate a lack of respect and bias. If the interviewer makes assumptions about your personal life or responsibilities, this can also indicate bias. And if the interviewer does not acknowledge your qualifications or your skill set at all, you guessed it, this could probably be another indication of bias. But let me be very clear the university does not tolerate discriminatory behavior in the workforce in any capacity at any time. This includes the interview process. And if you notice any of these signs, it's important to trust your instincts and try to address those issues respectfully. You can ask clarifying questions or politely redirect the conversation if you feel uncomfortable, or if you believe the interviewer is being biased. Ultimately, if you feel that the interview process has been unfair or biased, it is important to speak up and raise your concerns with the appropriate person or the department. You might ask, who do I go to for support? Well, your friendly talent acquisition partners, HR partners, or our partners in employee labor and relations are definitely here and able to help you should you feel you have experienced any bias or discrimination at any time during the interview process. Conducting a successful interview is a skill in itself and it takes practice, especially if you haven't done it in a while. So next we're going to talk about tips and tools to better prepare you for that next interview. Once you hit that submit button on the application, you are now considered an active applicant or a candidate. And there are a few reminders that we'd like to discuss. It's imperative to remember that once you apply, you need to respect the process and those all with whom are involved. You should no longer seek to have informational conversations with the hiring manager or anyone on the search committee as this should have happened prior to you applying. Refrain from reaching out to anyone involved in the search regarding getting any insider information or try to seek favoritism um, after you've applied. Once you have, um, once I had an applicant ask me how many finalists there were, and of those finalists, how many of those were internal. Uh, I also had another applicant ask me about specific departmental details. This is a huge mistake, as no additional information should be given to just one candidate, as that would be considered unfair and inequitable. And speaking of unfair and inequitable, I wanted to briefly cover a specific situation that comes up from time to time. Uh, we've seen situations where search committee members who have already been in the middle of the hiring process all of a sudden decide, huh, I too now want to throw my hat in the ring and apply for that same job. You know, maybe the hiring manager decided not to hire anyone. Um, maybe they wanted to go back to the pool to see if there were any viable candidates. Uh, or maybe after learning more about the job, you decide that, oh, this is actually interesting and I want to apply myself. No matter the case, since you've already had insider access to information and materials, this automatically gives you an unfair advantage. So with that said, if you are ever interested in a job but have been asked to participate in a search, please, just to be safe, 
consider recusing yourself altogether right from the get-go. Should you not recuse yourself early on, this would result in having to fail the search and require the committee to start again. The department would need to repost. There will need to be a brand new search committee as well as new interview questions, basically an entire new process. And this can put a considerable strain and have an adverse effect on the department. As a quick refresher, it's important to know and understand the general interview process here at UC Berkeley. Generally speaking, the university's interview process can take anywhere from four to 12 weeks on average to fill. Most of our positions outside of limited roles must have a two week grace period where managers should not be reviewing applications and allow the pool to grow. It's up to the manager to review and or consider applications that come in after the 14th day. As of February of 2021, UC Berkeley has now put in place a local implementing procedure where candidates are to be given the interview questions at least 15 minutes prior to an interview. We have found that this practice allows for a better candidate experience as a candidate can have more thoughtful and richer conversations. Once you receive these, conversa or these questions, use your time wisely and make notes to be thoughtful of your key points that you wanna cover in your responses. Also, take note of the number of questions being asked so that you can plan the length of your responses accordingly. While the interview process uh, and makeup can vary from recruitment to recruitment, we typically see an average of two to three rounds being taken place. This could consist of an IIQ, also known as an initial interview questionnaire, phone screen, panel interview, final round, second round, maybe even a third round, maybe a final round with the manager, et cetera. With that said, the more rounds there are, the longer the process can take. So again, plan accordingly. Now that you know the process a little bit, let's talk about what to do if you've been notified for a quest for interview. This is the fun part. The goal of the pre-interview preparation is to ensure that you represent yourself in the best possible light to increase your chances of landing the job. The first and maybe easiest thing to do is to start by researching the department or the university. Uh, if this is a new department to you, make sure that you're familiar with what they do, with who they serve, uh, what their mission and goals are, you know, visit their website, look at their org chart. Have they been in the news lately? Take a look at press releases or any new publications they might have had. All of this research will help tailor your answers and it shows that you generally are interested in that specific department. Next, review the job posting or description thoroughly. It's impo important to familiarize yourself with the responsibilities and the requirements of the job. Uh, take note of the requirements and responsibilities that are listed first or highest, as those tend to be the most imperative. As I mentioned before, interviewing takes a lot of practice, and the only way to do that is to practice out loud. Uh, by familiarizing yourself with the responsibilities and the requirements, you can assume that a lot of those interview questions will be tied to those responsibilities, helping you to develop richer and strategic responses. And make sure your responses are succinct, thorough, and that they tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the best way to practice this is by doing it out loud, as I mentioned before, um, so you can actually hear yourself. Try using your phone to record yourself. Uh, you can also use Zoom to record or see how you come off. Are you using too many filler words such as um and like? Ask to practice in front of a friend or a partner or a colleague and ask for their honest feedback. Pre-interview prep also covers your attire. Uh, this goes without saying, however, please dress appropriately and for the job that you're applying to. Just because you're an internal doesn't mean that you should put in any less effort into how you represent yourself. Plan your outfit ahead of time so you're not stressed about it on the day of. And lastly, get a good night's sleep. Reset your mind, your body, and start the day off right. And by following these steps, you can feel prepared and more confident knowing that you did everything you could to make the best first impression. A resource that you have in your back pocket to also help you prepare for the interview is to use your achieve goals. This is especially helpful if you are having trouble remembering all the goals that you've accomplished in the past year or maybe years. Uh, aligning yourself with your achievements is a great way to bolster your confidence and generate a thoughtful answer to any common interview questions that may come your way. 
you know, what did you excel at in your current role? Or maybe what did you seek improvement on? Or did you maybe need to seek improvement on something else? How have you shown collaboration in your work or been innovative? Where have you fostered DEIB in your workplace? And lastly, how have you become a master in your current role? You know, don't forget to also bring up any special recognition that you've been given. Did you receive a SPOT award, achievement award, outstanding chancellor staff award, perhaps? Uh, this is also so important as it shows that you've been going beyond your normal day-to-day -day responsibilities. And lastly, you want to ensure to be vocal about any professional development that you have completed during your tenure. Uh, this shows us that you are committed to your own development and that you are serious about your own career journey. Next, we're going to talk about the difference between uh, preparing for an in-person interview versus a virtual interview, uh, which has become the norm uh, post-pandemic. Here are some tips to help guide you in that in-person interview. Just in case, plan to bring extra copies of your resume uh, and that you have enough for everyone on the search committee. Come prepared with a list of references or perhaps any other pertinent uh, information or documents that you may be needed. Make sure that they are organized and easily accessible. Plan your route to the location ahead of time. Make sure there isn't construction going on or that the building isn't locked that will require access. Allow enough time to take into account any of these unforeseen situations. Arrive early to the room or lobby and allow yourself some time to calm down, relax, and collect your thoughts. And lastly, make sure that you are kind and respectful to everyone you encounter. This includes the students that may be working at the front desk or people just passing by. You never know who knows each other and what might be reported back should you be rude to anyone. Preparing for a virtual interview can be slightly different from preparing for an in-person interview. And here are some tips that can help you with that virtual interview experience. Technology, make sure your internet is stable. Uh, if you are able, try testing the link ahead of time to ensure that you're able to get in. Is there Zoom up to date? Uh, nothing is worse than having to do a mandatory update to your technology right before you need to log in. Tell everyone in your home to get off the Wi-Fi if need be, or perhaps block a room in a building or a campus to ensure that you have a space that is private and that has good connection. Make sure that you have good lighting and that you are in frame and, they're not, and that we're not just viewing the top of your head or the middle of your chest. Don't forget to clean off your camera to ensure a clear and crisp image. Test out your volume or consider using a microphone or headphones if you find that you're just not being loud enough. And if you're not sure how you're coming off, again, try recording yourself and play it back via Zoom or perhaps your phone. With your background, you want to make sure that your background is tidy and appropriate. And by appropriate, I don't mean having your clean laundry stacked neatly in the background. If your background is too busy or distracting, try to clean it up or minimize the clutter. Consider using a virtual one or putting up a sheet or even changing locations of at the time being. UC Berkeley offers specific Berkeley branded options via your Zoom account, should you want to consider that. And when you are on camera, you want to be cognizant of your body language. Make sure that you're sitting up and straight. Try using hand gestures, such as what I'm currently doing, and a practice good eye contact. Distractions. Finally, try to limit anything that can be a distraction to you or to the panel. Kennel your dog, put your cat in another room, or try choosing a room that does not have a, a busy window behind you. You want the focus to be all on you. Let's talk about practice. Yes, we are going to talk more about practice because practice makes perfect. There are quite a few different types of interview questions that you should be prepared for. Behavioral-based, scenario or situation-based, closed-ended questions, and open-ended questions. Behavioral-based questions typically start with phrases like, can you describe a time when, or have you ever, ever encountered a situation where, and they're gonna require you to provide a detailed response about how you may have handled a specific situation in the past. Majority of our questions are behavioral based since past performance commonly predicts future behaviors. And I don't mean that y'all can't change, but that is what the studies show. 
The key to answering behavioral-based questions is to provide specific and relevant examples that showcase your abilities and demonstrate your fit for the role. So really take the time to consider and map out your responses. Scenario questions will present a hypothetical situation or scenario and ask candidates to respond with how they would handle the situation. The goal of this type of question is to evaluate your problem solving skills, critical thinking ability, and your approach to handling complex situations. You may be asked something like, so your team is working on a project that is falling behind schedule due to unforeseen complications. How would you approach the situation and get the project back on track? The best way to answer scenario-based questions is to focus on the process of problem solving. Showcase your analytical thinking skills and make sure your response align, aligns with the specific scenario or situation that you're being asked about. Closed-ended questions can be answered and should be answered with a simple yes or no, or be very specific. It should be a very super brief response. These questions are often used to obtain specific information or to confirm details, such as, do you have experience with X type of software? Are you available to start on X date? Your response should be specific and concise. On the other hand, an open-ended question encourages a more detailed and nuanced response. And these questions typically start with phrases like, tell me about, or how do you feel about, and require a more detailed and thoughtful answer. Interviewers, will evaluate a candidate's communication skills, problem-solving abilities, and thought processes using more open-ended questions. So you should really take the opportunity to answer open-ended questions by thoroughly expressing your thoughts and ideas on the subject matter you're being asked about. Don't go on a rant. Be structured, thoughtful, and genuine in your responses. Probably the most common interview question of all time is tell us about yourself. More times than most, this will be the first question you're asked during the interview process. Tell us about yourself is the elevator pitch, is the razzle dazzle, is the sprinkles on top, and it's your time to shine. So imagine you're on an elevator and you meet the CEO of your dream company and they strike up a conversation. Then they ask you, where do you work? What do you do? And you start to realize this is your time to plug yourself. This is your chance to get the business card, the phone number, the LinkedIn, the contact of a lifetime that could change your circumstances forever. Now the elevator ride will only be about two to three minutes to the top floor. So you wanna be clear, concise, and to the point. In an interview, the idea is really no different. Introduce yourself. Tell them who you are, what your current role is, or your field of expertise. Highlight the skills and achievements you're most proud of, especially those that are intriguing and relevant to the position you're interested in. Avoid sharing personal information, too much tea, or irrelevant information that doesn't add value to your candidacy or your pitch. The tell us about yourself question is often a way for the interviewer to get to know you and assess your fit for the role. So be strategic in your response and showcase your strengths and qualifications for the job. So after your pitch, there might be several other common interview questions that you can expect to be asked during the interview. For instance, tell us about your background. You want, your, you want to keep your responses to this question specific to the role you're applying for and highlight your professional experience that aligns with the role. Or what about, can you describe a time when you experienced conflict with a coworker? How did you approach the situation and resolve the conflict? Now don't throw your coworker under the bus. That's not cute. But you do wanna describe the scenario, highlight the conflict and speak to how the conflict was resolved. We also have the question, can you describe a time when you overcame a specific challenge? For this question, you wanna take the time to think of a challenge that is relevant to the position that you're applying for and or a challenge that you may have encountered for this specific position. A Couple other common interview questions would be like, 
How do you stay organized and prioritize your tasks? Speak to how you organize your day-to-day -day tasks. What are your tools that you use to stay on track with your work? How do you meet your deadlines? This response should be specific and organized. Can you describe a time when you worked effectively as part of a team? This response should speak to your collaborative efforts and your willingness to be an active participant amongst the team. And lastly, you might be asked, why should we hire you? This is your moment to reiterate your interest in the role and emphasize your elevator pitch. Be honest, what will you add to the department and how will you inspire in this role? It is important to prepare for a variety of questions and to tailor your responses to the specific job and department you are applying for. By preparing and practicing your responses to common interview questions, you can increase your confidence and make a positive impression on the interviewer. Now, even if you know what questions you might be asked, because here at UC Berkeley, we have that 15 minute ahead of time rule to send interview questions, there's an easy method you can follow to answer these questions, such as the PAR method. The PAR method is a, is a way to answer questions in an interview in a very succinct way. You would use this method anytime there's a conflict or project-based question or behavioral-based question. And this method can help you organize your thoughts and show the interviewer how you're able to solve problems while ensuring you cover all of the important points of the question. PAR is an acronym, and at UC Berkeley, we love acronyms. PAR stands for problem or project, action, and results. In a PAR statement, the problem or project should describe a specific challenge or issue that you faced. The action should outline the specific steps that were taken to address the problem, and the result should explain the outcome or impact of those actions. So if you follow these three steps, you can quickly and easily set up your responses to cover a problem or project you faced, what you did to resolve the problem, and showcase the impact of your resolution with concrete results. Now, y'all know I like examples because I've given you a lot of them, but here's another quick one. If you're asked, can you just tell me about a time where you solved a problem within your organization? You can use the PAR method to respond. So the problem might be during my time in my current role, I noticed that our service team was struggling to keep up with the high volume of calls and emails during peak hours, which was leading to longer wait times and frustrated clients. And the action would be to address this problem. I worked with the service team to develop a new workflow that streamlined the process for handling customer inquiries. We also implemented, action word, we also implemented new tools and software that automated certain tasks and improved response time. The result would be, as a result of our efforts, we were able to significantly reduce wait times for clients and improve the overall satisfaction scores. The new workflow and tools are allowed, has allowed our service team to be more efficient and effective in their work. Using the PAR method makes it really easy to organize and outline a clear and concise response and helps to keep your responses strategically focused. So since this marks the midway point, uh, Colin, have there been any questions that have come in thus far from Q&A? We have time maybe to address one or two. Um, yeah, thank have, you. Oh, go for it, Maya. I was gonna say, we do have a question. Um, do you know if this process is the same at UCSF? As far as I know, this is a local implementing procedure um, regarding UC Berkeley. So I don't believe that at this time, UCOP has made it um, a standard practice across the campuses. And I'm, I'm assuming this is regarding the question around uh, interview questions given to the candidate 15 minutes prior is what I'm assuming. Uh, there is no clarification on that. However, um, if you would like to clarify if that is the question you're asking, um, please go ahead and submit another question. Um, how much context should be included in the PAR method, such as roles of the team, if pertinent, and the department name where the problem occurred? I'll take a stab on that one. Um, I would try to keep it 
generic enough so that you're not divulging so much information and so much in the weeds. Um, I think that's not the important part in terms of naming the department or, or folks, but, um, but I think, you know, you want to choose information that is relevant to the role, you know, say you're working on a, a technical project and you're applying for a technical position. You definitely want to kind of go into detail about that specific um, but again, you want to keep it relevant enough um, and keep it to information that really is, you know, what the search committee is looking to hear. I don't know, Maya, do you have anything to add? Um, I agree. I think that um, the department name is not important, um, if we're going to be clear. The department name is not important. The roles and or the names of members of the team is also not important. You want to be very specific to what the problem was. Um, how you fix the problem um, and what the result of the problem was. And none of that uh, information as far as the department and the roles of the teammates are, are important for this, uh, for the PAR method in this instance. Yeah. I think the role that you took is important, right? Because you're the one interviewing. So if you were the lead on this or if you, you know, whatever your responsibility was, I think it's definitely important to, to showcase that and highlight um, what specific you did. Um, so another question, if we have time for one more, and then we'll continue. How should one contact an interviewer if they have not contacted you after not receiving the job, especially after follow up, following up several times? Um, I can kind of jump in here. I did answer this question as far as we got another question earlier. Do you let individuals know if they did not receive the position after interviewing? Um, a lot of times, if you don't receive uh, follow up such as what your status is of the interview, um, it's because the recruitment is still in progress. And we typically, you know, do not deselect and correspond with applicants who are not selected until the recruitment wraps up because it's still ongoing. Um, probably the response that you would get would be that the recruitment is still ongoing and we're unable to provide any additional information at this time. Um, but we do, you know, keeping in mind that a recruitment can take anywhere from three weeks to a couple months. Um, don't be nervous if you haven't heard anything. Um, it, that's just might be how long it takes to receive a response. However, if you're reaching out directly to the interviewer, um, I would not recommend that. I would actually recommend reaching out to the recruiter um, because the interviewer should not be providing you any additional information um, about the status of the recruitment. Do you have anything else on that, um, Tara? I don't. I think let's just go right back in and we'll see. Awesome. Hopefully there's some time at the end. So, um, you oh, know, we've got just about 10 minutes to go and y'all are doing great. Keep it up. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. So you've researched, you've prepared and practiced, uh, but now it's time for the actual interview. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about some general interview etiquette and some do's and don'ts scenarios. Obviously your objective is to get the job. However, you still need to earn it. So it's your responsibility to showcase your skills, highlight your strengths and prove to the search committee that you are the most qualified person for the role. Uh, we've said it time and time again, interviewing is a two-way street. Um, they are the ones that are looking so desperately to fill the role and are eager to find the most qualified person. You already have a job, so don't forget that, that you also hold power. So use that to your advantage. It's important to understand where the hiring manager and the search committee are coming from. An organization will always seek to meet the needs of the business. Uh, they will have their objective, which is obvious since they initiated the recruitment in the first place, uh, but their sole responsibility to fill the role with the right person. They are looking to see how competent you are, how well you can do the job. They're looking at how well you will fit in with the team and within the organization. Are you aligned with their mission? Do you hold the same values as the department? How well can you build relationships and collaborate with others? And can you demonstrate your ability to work well within that team? They're also very interested in knowing and assessing what motivated you to apply. And will you actively be engaged in the role? And are you striving to make an impact? And lastly, what value will you add to the role and to the organization? The wrong hire can not only be costly for the department, but it can lower morale and result employee burnout. 
the search committee has a tough job. So it's up to you to try to make it a little easier with outlining how you best meet their objectives. Now that you have a better understanding of the interviewer's objective, let's take a trip down interview lane. Uh, appropriate interview etiquette involves being professional, respectful, and attentive during the interview process. On the flip side, inappropriate interview behavior or etiquette can create a negative impression and harm your chances of being selected for the role. So general interview etiquette consists of taking notes. You know, while having your resume out, consider using it to take notes on. Jot down key words that you may want to refer back to at a later time. This also shows how engaged you are in the process. Should you need more time to respond to a question or seek clarifications, feel free to ask them to repeat it. This can help you buy some time. And while your resume is out, don't forget to actually use it as a guide to help you refer back to for specific examples or experience that you've had. By strategic or by being strategic with using the PAR method that was discussed earlier by Maya, um, make sure to use that method um, revolving questions um, that have to deal with problems that you had to solve. Try to notice the time by checking your watch or clock in the room or maybe slyly tapping on your phone. You want to show that you have awareness and that you are able to manage your time effectively and efficiently. You don't want to talk so much that you run out of time and you're not able to get asked, uh, get around to asking your own questions at the end. And lastly, try to come prepared with a few questions already written down so it's easier for you to refer back to. Try writing those follow-up questions either on the back side of your resume or on a blank piece of paper for easy access. Whether you are participating in a virtual interview or an in-person interview, it's important to conduct yourself professionally and confidently to make a positive impression on the interviewer. Here are some tips for how to conduct yourself during an interview. When you enter the room, make sure you greet everyone. Regardless if you know the members or not, just still introduce yourself and go around the room to greet everyone appropriately. Make sure you listen carefully to the search committee members and hiring manager. A tip I have found helpful that adds a nice touch uh, is that if you aren't familiar with everyone in the, on the committee, jot down their names in order as they're sitting, as they're introducing themselves in the beginning. That way, as they take turns asking you questions, you can refer back to what you wrote down and use their name in your response. So for an example, oh, thank you, Maya, for a great question. As you can see from my experience, da da da, -da. you get the picture. Uh, this little touch shows how attentive you are and how well you listen and are engaged. Body language goes a long way. Uh, make sure you're using open body language, um, open body gestures versus coming off as being closed off. For example, are you sitting up in your chair, broad shoulders, hands open and in front of you while making eye contact? Or are you slumped in your chair, sitting very relaxed, arms crossed, uh, closed off nonverbals can be viewed as negatively, and this is even without you opening your mouth to speak. Next, make sure that your responses to questions are relevant and examples used are the most current if possible. Uh, now, if a question comes up in an area that you maybe don't have relevant experience, then most definitely you can use your older experience. Uh, for example, if I was asked a supervisory question, I might answer with something like this. You know, that's a great question, Maya. Uh, and while supervision hasn't been a part of my duties and responsibilities in my current role, uh, in my past role at XYZ Company, I did manage five full-time employees where I was responsible for their day-to-day -day operations, training, payroll, schedule, et cetera. You get the drift. Um, this at least shows the committee that while it may not be the most recent experience, it's still experience worth noting. And lastly, no matter what happens in the interview, to ensure that you end on a positive note, close the interview by reiterating your interest and passion for the role and thank everyone for their time. So now we're going to switch gears to cover some common interview scenarios that can often arise. You know, what do you do if a supervisor is on the panel? You know, having your supervisor on the panel can be intimidating and cause some anxiety, um, but there's some ways to get around that. First is be professional at all times. Treat them just as you would with any other interviewer. Now is not the time to bring up current workload or talk about anything personal. Uh, try to compartmentalize this process with your current position. 
don't assume having your supervisor can be looked at as having its advantages as well as its disadvantages. On one hand, uh, your supervisor already knows you and the work that you do, even though that is outside information that should not be considered in the process. Uh, so you may think that they will more likely recommend you for the role, but on the other hand, they may know you too well or think that you're too close to the work, ultimately not recommending you for the role. You know, managers are trained to remain neutral in this process, so it's really up to you to demonstrate your skills and convey how you're the best fit. Next, be honest with your responses. This is not the time to embellish your skills or stories and try to make yourself look better than what the actual truth is. Um, you know, if you're asked a question about a certain software, knowing that your department doesn't use it, um, while you may have been able to embellish it at a different time, a different committee, it won't fly here. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. And lastly, follow the interview with a thank you note or email to everyone on the committee, not just your supervisor. Uh, small gestures really go a long way. And at the end of the day, your supervisor is just one member of the interview panel, and it's important to treat them and the process just like you would with anyone else. Next, we're going to talk about uh, inappropriate questions that if, if what happens if one were to be asked of you. It's important to remember that there are certain questions that employers are not allowed to ask during an interview, such as, you know, questions about salary, age, race, gender, disability, sexual orientation, just to name a few. Uh, if you're asking an inappropriate question during an interview, remember, take a deep breath, calm, pause, try not to become defensive or confrontational, but rather address the question in a different way. Try redirecting the conversation back to your qualifications um, and to what is relevant to the role. You know, say you're asked, oh my gosh, you went to Chico State. That's great. You know, what year did you graduate? All right. Um, and while it may seem harmless, you can still redirect an answer with something like, well, you know, while the year I graduated isn't relevant for the role, I can tell you about the focus of my degree. Now, if you are altogether uncomfortable, you have every right to decline to answer, um, or you may just address it, the issue directly by saying, you know, my apologies, but how is this question relevant to the skills needed to perform, to perform the job? This will cause a committee to pause and reflect of what is uh, of what is it that they actually just asked you, and most likely they will realize that, gosh, what they asked you wasn't probably the best question, and they might stop right there. Generally speaking, um, there's usually positive intent when being asked questions. However, you do have the right to be treated with respect during the process. Um, so as you feel that um, these rights have been violated, please feel free to reach out to your HR business partner or talent acquisition advisor. Now, there may be time where you've gone through the process and realized that the job isn't for you, and that's okay. Um, this is what to do if you um, are in those scenarios. You know, the moment you realize that this isn't the right fit, be honest with the hiring manager and let them know right away. You can decide whether or not you want to go into detail um, if you think that that could possibly help the manager. Uh, no matter what, treat the situation with the utmost professionalism. You want to remain positive about the experience. You know, Berkeley is all about developing relationships and connections. And the last thing you want to do is burn a bridge um, as this campus is smaller than you think. Um, and it would be a shame if this were to come back around to uh, impact you negatively, you know, the next time you were to apply for a job. And lastly, I want to leave you with a few mistakes internal candidates often make. You know, since you're already working within the organization and applying for a new one, you may think that you have an advantage over external candidates, which in some cases, yes, you do. Um, you know what it's like to work for the university. You already have insight to the challenges that one may face. You already have relationships established. But this doesn't give you the entitlement to get the role, and you must earn it. Um, being internal could also have its disadvantages as well. You know, may, you may, again, be perceived uh, as being too close to the work um, where you lack innovation or new ideas. Maybe you don't have 100% of the skill set and you're trying to convey your transferable skills. So here are some common interview mistakes that we've seen along the way as it pertains to internal candidates. Sometimes internal candidates think that they don't need to prepare as much. As we mentioned earlier, it's important to practice what you're going to say and gain insight to what is most important to the hiring manager and the department. Do your due diligence. Don't assume this is particular in the case where you're interviewing within the same department or maybe the same manager. 
Don't gloss over experience because you're assuming the manager or the committee already knows what it is that you do. They have been trained to only consider information that is provided during the application and interview process and nothing else. It's really up to you to be strategic with using or leveraging your internal knowledge of the department or the university in your interview. Um, this is why it's so important to be thorough with your examples and not leave anything out just because you think they already know or you think this job is in the bag. By preparing thoroughly and focusing on your qualifications and most importantly, taking ownership of your own result and how you show up, you can walk away knowing that you performed well and be proud of what you accomplished, no matter the outcome. Another mistake internals often make is just being too casual. You know, they, this is not the time to crack jokes or be lackadaisical about the process. You want to show that you're serious about the role. Um, you just never know who else might be prepared to bring in the, to bring it in the interview and uh, fight and who is fighting for the same role. And lastly, we see all the time with internals is that they just aren't prepared in bringing questions, that they don't ask any questions at the end. They might say, well, I already know about the department and the challenges, so I really have no further questions. Uh, this can pre be perceived as either not taking it seriously or thinking that you're just that confident in getting the role um, because you feel like, meh, I just don't need to know anything else. I know it all. You know, while this is a huge disappointment for the committee, it's really a lost opportunity on your part. Uh, so in closing, to better your chances of advancing your career, try to avoid these common mistakes at all possible. So let's talk about following up. Look, if you don't follow up, you're really missing a great opportunity to ask follow-up questions. So be inquisitive and reiterate your interest in the opportunity. As you wrap up the interview, remember that you hold the power. Interviewing is a two-way street and you have just as much power as the interviewer. Please don't talk negatively about past experiences. If it's on campus, the university is smarter than you think and you would never want to burn any bridges or anything to get out that wasn't intended. This is not the time to talk about salary, vacation, schedules. You can discuss that with the recruiter. You wanna be personable and professional but do not bring up personal information. Please do be strategic about asking good follow-up questions, clarifying questions um, to some of the questions that were asked previously in the interview, and make sure to always close the interview and reiterate your interest and thank everyone for their time. Feel free to ask timeline questions if there's enough time, but don't lead with that question. Use your time wisely. Of course, we love a good follow-up question. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there are just a few that we love. And even internal candidates have something to gain from asking follow-up questions. It's a great way to engage with the rest of the committee members and show them that you care about what they have to say. So one, one great interview question would be, if you were to look at the top current performers on your team, what quali qualities do they possess um, that makes them top performers? Another good one might be, as a supervisor, how do you handle feedback and opportunities for improvement? Or how do you support diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic initiatives in the workplace to ensure that they are not performative? So as we're running uh, into time, I just wanna talk about some tools and resources um, that you, know, you may come across or may need. They're super helpful. We have the UC Career Center um, that provides tools to learn about strengths skills and opportunities within the UC system, um, and People and Culture's uh, professional organization and development team offers a variety of professional development opportunities for all staff across campus. We do have a couple questions in the chat, um, and I will go ahead and check those out, but please do join us for the interactive process coming up next at 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, we, we know that some folks are, are going to be needing to transition over there in about 10, 15, 30 seconds. We just want to give a huge, huge round of applause to Maya and Tara for their incredible presentation this morning. Everybody, please make sure to grab the QR code so that you can uh, provide your perspectives, complete the survey for the session. If you miss the chance of grabbing it, 
you'll get an invitation to complete a survey for the conference. Don't worry, we'd love your feedback. For those who registered for your group coaching sessions, we wanna invite you to go ahead, leave the virtual online webinar platform and head on over to grab your invitation for your group coaching session with our amazing UC Berkeley Talent Acquisition Team and continue the conversation there. Bring the questions forward there. Uh, get into those dialogue convers uh, those dialogue groups, practice some skills, meet some new people. We are so, so thankful for your attendance today. Maya and Sarah, great work. Thank you all so much. You are absolutely amazing. Another round of applause for Maya and Sarah. You're getting a lot of love in the chat there. And we all know you got to go and facilitate your group coaching sessions. So have fun, everybody. We'll see you back here at nine o'clock tomorrow morning for our Wednesday webinar on communication for introverts. Really excited about that one. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Everyone.